Atomic Ions Part 2, we'll call this. <laughs> we'll continue on from our first lecture there about the introduction. Whoops, let's spell it right. Polyatomic Ions, we'll call this Part 2. So we just touched on the idea of a polyatomic ion and what it was, a group of atoms that are held together in a different kind of bond than what we could call an ionic bond, but, but they form an ion because the way that they jingle about their electrons is such that they're, they're missing a few or they have a few to get rid of. So they're very much like the elements in group one and two on the periodic table and the non-metals that are always looking to give or take electrons, and so they can form an ionic bond. Um, now, we learned about four or five of them yesterday, but now we're going to look at sort of the, the, the somewhat of a pattern that they follow, so we can see how, how to identify them. I'm going to introduce you to a new one today, and um, I'm going to call it chlorate. I don't know if that was on our list yesterday. I don't, or on Friday, I don't think so. And that chlorate is Cl, that's chlorine, right? And then it's got three oxygens attached to it and a minus. That's what chlorate looks like. Well, it turns out that many polyatomic ions have different configurations. And usually, with these particular kind anyway, it's the oxygen atoms that can change the number of them. And so we will also find that you can add an extra. Right? So right here I'm going to make a column and I'm going to put add O. Okay? I might need that to be a little bit bigger. So this will be the adding an O. In other words, we're going to add another oxygen atom to the chlorate. So if we add an oxygen to chlorate, it becomes ClO4. Now, the ClO4 will sort of share electrons amongst it, the atoms inside there. And it won't change this little charge number. It'll still be a minus charge overall. Um, one thing about the polyatomic ions is the actual charge number does not usually change, except in a few extreme circumstances. But now we need a new name for this, right? We need a name for it because it's different than chlorate. So when we add an oxygen like this, we add a prefix, per, P-E-R, and we call it perchlorate. Perchlorate. So if you see the word per, that means you're talking about the, the polyatomic ion that has an extra oxygen than the 8 version. The 8 version, the chlorate, is kind of like the standard version of it, right? And we compare all the others to it. Okay, I'm going to move this line across here because we have to make a couple more columns. Rather than add an electron, or an, an oxygen atom, sorry, you can actually uh, have one less. So if I put one less O, and we're always comparing to the chlorate over here at the beginning, right? So if there's one less than that, it would be ClO2. And it would have a minus charge. So you see how it looks a little different got one less oxygen than the original chlorate that we were comparing it to. So we need to give that a name because it's different. And so what we do is we change the ending to it instead of eight. So we call this chlorite with an I. A little bit different, but similar. And then it's also possible in some cases we have two less oxygens than the original chlorine. And if that were the case, you would just have a Cl and one O like this, ClO. 
And of course, we would need a name. For, oh, we would have a minus as well. If they all have the same minus one charge. That's kind of easy to remember. But what are we going to call this? Well, if chlorite is one less, and then we want to even less than that, there's a word that in, in science that we use that means something that's less or lower, and it's called hypo. Right? If you're hypothermic, you have less heat than you're supposed to have. Hypothermia means you're too cold, right? So this would mean you have less oxygen than your than chlorate, and so we call it hypo. But here's the funny thing: we keep the ite, so hypochlorite. So we have chlorate, which is the standard version of the uh, polyatomic ion. Then we have perchlorate with an extra oxygen. We have chlorite with one less, and we have hypochlorite with two less. And that's sort of the pattern that we use. However, you can't memorize that uh, anything with a two is an ite. It doesn't work that way. All that means is one less than the original chlorate over here. So you still have to memorize the starting point, right? So if I give you another example, for instance, if I did nitrate, that would be similar to this. Let me do um, sulfate. If I, you remember from yesterday or from the last video, uh, sulfate was SO4 to minus. And so you see how it starts with a different number of oxygens. So it won't match up with chlorate and chlorite and all of those, but it will follow the pattern. So you can have, you know, for instance, you can have per sulfate, which would add um, would add uh, one. Oh, wait a minute now. Let me just check my list here. Yeah, per sulfate. So your SO5 with a 2 minus, that would be called per sulfate. Or the problem with chemistry is that the, the, the problem with chemistry is that when we first started div discovering chemistry, it, it developed over hundreds, if not if not even a thousand or more years in some cases. And so People that found something and they gave it a name, then they found something else and they gave it another name, and then they realized much later that there were patterns. And so a lot of the, the names that we use are old-fashioned names that have just been hung on because they're common and they don't fit the pattern. So there's lots of exceptions to the rules when we're talking about naming things. So for instance, this this one I've just drawn, this per sulfate, is also known as peroxymonosulfate. Right? Well, why would it be called that? Why don't they just call it per sulfate? Well, a lot of people might call it per sulfate, especially nowadays. But it also has another name because it's kind of an exception. If you took one oxygen away from the original sulfate and got SO3, that's the one, whoops, two minus. That's the one you would call sulfite. So you see, it's not the same number here. So the number cannot be used to tell what's an ite and what's an eight. You have to compare it to the original. If the original had three oxygens, then the ite has two. But if the original had four oxygens, then the ite has three. So it's always a comparison to the memorized form. Right of the first one, the sulfate that we talked about. And you could also have hyposulfite here. We could have SO2. That's two less than the original sulfate. So that could be called hyposulfate. Uh, sorry, sulfite. Sulfite, yeah. The fight. Hypo always has and goes with an ite. You'll never have hypo with an eight. Okay? So that's kind of the pattern. Now, here's the other interesting thing. While there is a pattern, not every polyatomic ion has every part of the pattern. So, for instance, I'll give you 
another example. Uh, if we look at, let's just carry our chart down. Remember what the titles were. Let's look at our friend uh, phosphate, P O four three minus. So that's phosphate. We saw that one in the last video too, I think. Well, um, if you follow the rules, then this would be per phosphate, right? And you would add an oxygen and you'd get PO5 3 minus. But the funny thing is, is that this arrangement of atoms doesn't seem to be stable enough to actually work. So in, in nature, in reality, there is no such thing as perphosphate. We don't see it. Even though you can follow the rule and you can create it according to the pattern, it's not something we see out there in the real chemistry world. There is, however, a phosphite, which is PO3. That one does exist. Now, here's another confusing thing. Hypophosphite, according to the pattern, does not exist. All right? So if you were to, to write here, I'll do it in black, PO2, 3 minus, and you wanted to call that hypophosphite, it doesn't exist. That's following the pattern, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't work. However, <laughs> they discovered another polyatomic ion, that is H2PO2. It's got an H in it, and it's called hypophosphite. So now we have another exception to the rule that one, which does not follow the patterns at all, but it has the same name. So you can see how it can become very confusing for someone trying to learn this from the very start. And that's why usually we don't worry too much about these exceptions at first, right? We, I'm, we're going to be working with the polyatomic ions that tend to follow the rules and are a little more common uh, then. But I'm showing you this so you're aware of it, because next year and the year after, you will have to learn how to use them all. Okay? Now, on the chart I'm going to give you, there's a whole list of the, of the polyatomic ions that sort of follow this pattern. Okay, they sort of follow the pattern. But on the chart, uh, in fact, I'll pause the video and I'll give you that chart right now. All right, so I've given you a chart that has all of the most common uh, polyatomic ions that follow this oxygen pattern. And a lot of them don't exist. You can build them using the pattern, but they don't exist. So it actually helps to narrow down the, the field. But there are other polyatomics. I'm going to call them irregular names. Irregular names. These are ones that have just been named something, uh, usually historically, and they don't really follow any patterns. And so once again, we have to memorize them. And there are lots of them, and they're on the next part of your chart. But I'll highlight some of the most common ones that we'll use here. The one uh, very common one that I showed you yesterday or on Friday was hydroxide. Hydroxide, which is an OH and a minus. Hydroxide is confusing because it ends with ide. And it's not supposed to do that, right? That's for, like, you know, when you have sodium fluoride and strontium chloride. This one ends with ide, but it is a polyatomic ion. It's an O and an H together, and it's a very common one. So you have to memorize that one. Let's see. Another uh, important one that you might see is ammonium. Ammonium. And it is NH4 and a plus. Okay? Don't confuse it with ammonia. Ammonia is another chemical, NH3. Right? And pneumonia is when your lungs get filled with fluid and you cough a lot. That's not a chemical at all. So don't confuse pneumonia, ammonia, uh, 
and ammonium. Let's watch. Uh, let's see. Uh, another one that's relatively common. You'll see it next year, so I'll give it to you now. It's um, uh, called hydronium. Now, the reason I'm showing you this one is we're not going to use it very much, but when you start, uh, when we start studying acids and bases as chemicals, this one will show up, and so will the hydroxide. They kind of work together. So it's like H3O plus. Looks a lot like water. In fact, it is a water molecule that has grabbed a hydrogen from somewhere, so it's got an extra one. And we'll talk about how that one works later. Um, peroxide is another kind of common one. It's simply O2. You may have heard of hydrogen peroxide, or sometimes we just call it peroxide for short. Peroxide actually means this ion, with a O2 with a 2 minus. But we put hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2, we put that on cuts, right, to, to clean them. If we get a cut that's dirty, it, it disinfectant. It, it destroys cells, and so it can, it can destroy bacteria cells that are growing in a wound, let's say. It also destroys some of your own cells, but it's kind of worth it. We lose a few cells to make sure we don't develop a serious infection. The rest of them are on the chart if we need them, but we're not going to get too crazy because there's a lot of them to memorize. Irregular polyatomic ions. Okay, then if you go to the next page, you'll see there's one more group of polyatomic ions, and we're going to look at those as well. These are with hydrogen. Now, the other ones sometimes have hydrogen, too. So again, every rule for chemistry naming has exceptions, right? But there are general patterns. So here are some common ones. And, and the, 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 the prefix that you'll often see when you're talking about hydrogen is bi, B-I, right? That can mean two, like a bicycle has two wheels, right? Bicycle. But in chemistry, bi can also indicate hydrogen. So, for instance, HSO4 minus is called bisulfate. It looks just like sulfate, right? If you, if you ignore the H, uh, you'll see that it's just like SO4. But with the H on there, it changes the charge number. Instead of the 2 minus, it's only a 1 minus. And that's called bisulfate. Another common one is bicarbonate, HCO3. You'll see it looks just like carbonate. Right? Carbonate, if you look on the other part of the page there, it's CO3, but it was a 2 minus. And so the charge here is only 1 minus because the hydrogen, hydrogen is added. And there are others. Um, but they're not going to be ones that we're going to use a lot, but they are on the sheet. So those are just some examples, okay? All right. So uh, that's how they work. Unfortunately, they are not very convenient. They are all over the place. There's lots of exceptions. Some don't even exist, even though you could predict them with the patterns. They don't exist. And so learning them all is sort of uh, a beginning chemist's worst nightmare. But it is uh, something we'll get used to. And, and it's like anything else. The more you use it, the more it just becomes natural to you. So these are the polyatomic ions. Okay, so we're going to stop here.